Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Local leaders have said time and again that the future of the Cincinnati Riverfront involves much more than the placement and development of two professional sports facilities. In November, the voters finally settled the Broadway Commons versus Baseball on Main fight. Now it is time to tackle the really tough task, figuring out how those two giant pieces in the puzzle fit together with all the other pieces, parking, an intermodal transportation center, an expansive park, the proposed National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, and a variety of other dreams various people want to throw on the table, including restaurants, beer halls, retail shops, theaters, housing, etc., etc. With the baseball site settled, that planning process has resumed under the direction of the City, City of Cincinnati, Hamilton County, Riverfront Joint Steering Committee. In addition to working out all the particulars, the joint nature of the planning process once again offers local governments another chance to forge a constructive working relationship. To discuss the task of the Joint Commission and its relationship to the public, I am joined by two of its members. Phil Heimlich uh, is a member of the Cincinnati City Council and is one of the officials from the city representing the city to the Joint Commission. Bob Bettinghouse is, of course, Hamilton County Commissioner and is also a member of the Joint Planning Commission. Welcome back to Newsmakers. Good to be here. Glad to be here, Dan. Where, Phil, where do we stand right now? The vote's over, the, the Joint Commission. I know you held a hearing on November 20th. You've got another meeting uh, this coming Friday, as I understand it, December 18th. Where realistically do we stand in this master planning process? Well, let's keep in mind there's two groups to think about. One is the joint city-county steering committee that you referred to. Okay. I, I chair the city side of that, and Bob represents the county. But we generally we meet together, and we're using that committee to handle the planning between the city and the county. We have since agreed to ask a group of people were calling the Riverfront Advisors, which are people in the biz primarily in the business community with development experience and with architectural experience and planning experience to essentially serve as the group that guides the development of the Riverfront and that advises us on what should go where and, uh, and we're going to hopefully follow the recommendations. Who are some of those people? What are some of the names of those people? Well, we're not going to, we haven't decided that, but we hope to have that group decided by next week. Okay. So this is still in an early stage of this of this process. I mean, you've got you've still got the advisors group to put together. You're still still working with lots of pieces. Well, that's true, but we have a pretty strict timetable, and we expect to have the full group named by next Friday. And we have a strict timetable. Within six months, we expect to have a preferred developer chosen to begin working on the riverfront. Okay, uh, Bob, what's let's let's just I gave that laundry list of things. Let's try to figure out what's fixed and what's not. We know the Bengal site is fixed because it's going up. Red site is not yet fixed exactly, is it? Well, I think, Dan, if you look at all the projects that you have in this area, there are some that are fairly well fixed. First okay. of all, Fort Washington Way, all right. which, which is uh, under construction right now and I think will be the project that changes the face of the riverfront more than anything else that's going on right now. Uh, that's due to be finished in August of the year 2000. It's on budget. It's on time. All right. The football project, uh, Paul Brown Stadium, obviously that's coming up out of the ground. That's due to be finished in August of 2000. It's on budget. It's on time. The baseball project is going to be located in the baseball on main site, generally between the Crown and, and, uh, and uh, Synergy Field. Uh, there's some tweaking, whether it's you know 50 feet here, 100 feet there, but generally that's set. Uh, the only other project that really is set, uh, I, I think, out of uh, out of uh, Momentum is the Underground Railroad Freedom Center, which has a uh, probably the, the premier site on the riverfront right at the foot of the suspension bridge. Short of that, or with those, with those things set, the parks, the other opportunities for retail, office, commercial uh, opportunities in this area, those are the things that we need to set our sights on right now and determine what is the best mix of this so that we can make this riverfront truly an icon that when people think of Cincinnati, this is the first thing they think of. Well, when we think about priorities and all of those things that are there, clearly one of the priorities is parking. I mean, this is um, a big issue. And I know that in, in the plan that you were working with uh, on the 20th, and we've got some examples here, this is a graph, as I understand it, as sort of surface parking options. If, if there's 
no structures. And then there's a bunch of other possibilities going up to more complicated, structured uh, parking. And I think we've got an example of that uh, that will come up on the screen in a minute. Is this, is the part, there it is. Is this, a, this parking question, is this one of the first things that has to be settled? There are a couple of issues that need to be settled, and one has already been settled. The first one was, do we build a structured second street so as to allow for the intermodal transportation center right. to take all of the buses and, and to create that on the riverfront? The state came through with $11 million in funding. The city and county are working together on that through the Fort Washington Way project. And I, my understanding is that there's federal money. There's iced tea money. And there's also that, some so iced tea money. $8 in million in iced tea uh, money. Our goal, and, and from the county side of this, we look at this as three separate projects that we're involved in, football, baseball, and this parking and infrastructure. And our goal is to concentrate a core of parking in that area between the two stadiums that pulls the parking as close to the city as possible, which accomplishes two things. First of all, it allows the rest of the ri central riverfront area to be used for parkland. And more importantly, it provides a parking reservoir not just for Reds fans and Bengals fans, but also for downtown office workers and shoppers who want to come downtown. And Phil, is that, would the city be coming at this from about the same perspective on, on that issue, on the parking issue? Yeah, exactly. In fact, our biggest concern since the stadiums were decided is that we have structured parking and not a so-called sea of surface parking. Which, which was just, that first thing we saw. Yeah, which looks pretty ugly, to be quite honest. And but now we get to the question, and I think this is what you brought up here, Dan, is what goes on top of that structured parking. And that's really what this Riverfront Advisors Group is about. We know we want parking. We know Fort Washington Way is going forward. We know the stadiums are going forward. But what are the developments that we're going to have? And the only thing on top, as Bob was saying before, that is more or less certain is the Freedom Center. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, but even the legislation, let's point out, even the legislation, that hasn't been locked in stone yet, right? I mean, everybody sort of agrees on a site, but not everybody, the, the legislation hasn't been passed to make that happen. I think it? the Freedom Center has a long way to go before it, uh, they start putting the first brick in place. Okay. Uh, but I, 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 when I was talking uh, at the earlier part of this, it was with the understanding that that is the one project that seems to have enough momentum that it's going to be a reality. Okay, then all these other things that could go on mm -hmm. top that I did the, I did the laundry list. Uh, restaurants, uh, beer halls, uh, housing, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, from the city perspective, um, is there a priority list? Is there, have you worked out among yourselves what, what you would like to see there? Well, the whole reason for getting some outside help from people with business experience, architecture experience, development experience is that it isn't decided by politicians and city administrators. We want people in the private sector that really have the know-how, really have done things in other cities, that have, have seen what other cities have done. We want their expertise and their recommendations. I, I want them to tell us. I don't want Phil Heimlich or our city manager, John Shirey, or even my good friend, Bob Bettinghouse. I think we need to take this out of the government people. Let me ask a question, though. Um, are we recreating the wheel here? I mean, is there any community voice? Is there any uh, opportunity for the average person to have a voice in this so we don't have one more initiative that has to go back to the ballot and people are mad because of what the decision is? What about integrating into this some sort of public voice? First of all, Dan, I want to put something straight. There's not really a city uh, preference or a county preference. and and, and I. I'm doing my best to, to kind of stamp out this well, whole idea that the city I, I and sort of county can't, can't get along and, any longer. And that's the way I set it up, right. because I said this is another joint. But then you right. said well, there's really two groups that are trying to work together. <laughs> I'm just trying to see how much real cooperation and how much feed in from the community there really is. Well, I, first of all, I think you are going to see real cooperation between the city and the county, both at the political level and at the staff level. The idea of having community input is, is an important and valuable aspect of what we're about trying to com accomplish. Uh, the Riverfront Advisors, I'm sure, will take input from community groups. And let's not forget that we still have Urban Design Associates, who is in the process of putting together a master plan for the entire Riverfront area, and they will accept community input. Uh, along the way, a lot of people but have is been that critical. Is in your expectation, in your plans, is that structured in? Are the community advisors told to get out in the community someplace? 
systematically as UDA told to get not just a report to the community at convention center when they finished but you know to really get input is there is that happening and well, I, I ask that just honestly I don't I'm not I don't know but well, the, the answer from UDA is absolutely they mm -hmm. will have community input in, in their process the Riverfront Advisors group I think is a little different uh, I, I think there will be an aspect of community input there but we're asking uh, some professionals to help us make some of these value judgments between hotels, residential, uh, uh, entertainment, beer halls, you know, whatever right. it might be. And I think we're looking for a, a different level of, of input from that group. One of the things we haven't talked about specifically, which is sort of each of us has mentioned it quickly, is the whole park thing, that the park board, Jack Wilson and um, Steve Shuckman and his crew are working on. Uh, is that sort of like the Freedom Center? We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know how big it is, but everybody agrees that there should be a substantial green space down there. I actually think the Freedom Center is a little more f along than the park concept because the Freedom Center at least has a pretty set plan about how they're going to raise their money. The park plan looks nice, but there's no money at this point. So I certainly would like this Riverfront Advisors Group to take a long look at that and make sure that that's the right thing to do. If it is, and if we can get the money, then that's fine. Phil raises the always touchy point of money. What is the responsibility of the county coming out of the sales tax? I know it's uh, Paul Brown Stadium and the new Red Stadium. Is the structured parking going to come out of that sales tax? Absolutely, and we've said that from the beginning. Okay. Uh, we, we have uh, Paul Brown Stadium, uh, the Red Stadium, and then the infrastructure and parking that will allow for the rest of the riverfront to be, uh, to be left for other uses. Uh, we have, in our financing plan, uh, set aside about $110 million or $115 million for this parking project. Uh, so we have included that so, from our from the very beginning. So of our what's project. the total right now that you're projecting has to come from the sales tax? About 825 million dollars. So that's 825 million. Now there's these other things. Now, you know, the intermodal thing comes from state and federal money, and maybe some local money too. And county and city Just money. County right. and city money. Right. The National Underground Railroad Freedom Center and some private money and some various levels of of government money. Um, what about something like the park? Could that come? from the sales tax, just keep collecting the sales tax longer? Uh, we've been very, very clear about this from the very beginning, that the sales tax that the voters approved back in March of 1996 was only for stadiums and related facilities. It is not available for the convention center. It's not available to uh, create the park. It's not available for isn't any that, of these other projects. Isn't that projects. related? Uh, abs I, I don't think so. No? Uh, okay. You know, we, we were very clear, and I thought very straightforward with voters when we went to them in March of 96, that we were going to jumpstart this whole riverfront project, and that it was going to be the responsibility of some others to, to come in and We well, you know, on Thursday it. of this week, it became clear that the county's sales tax, not just the, the sales tax you're collecting for the, um, uh, for the stadiums, but the other sales tax and the other taxes that you raise, is generating more funds. Might some of those funds be channeled into this uh, this opportunity on the riverfront? Uh, we have an opportunity right now with a very good economy uh, to be in a, a pretty comfortable situation in Hamilton County. We're going to spend the next year trying to figure out what it is that we do uh, into the future. Do we roll back taxes, which I think is a very real opportunity for us? Uh, do we look at, at what other opportunities we have to perhaps pay off debt? Certainly, we would consider other opportunities for development throughout Hamilton County. Remember, yeah. Cincinnati's riverfront is important, but we do represent 860,000 people, not just uh, the city of Cincinnati. Phil, uh, what about the city? Are you experiencing the same sort of uh, influx of unexpected tax revenues and therefore might have some funds to put into these sorts of projects? I'd say yes to the first question, probably okay. no to the second, and here's why. If you look at our budget. We do have a surplus this year. We have a surplus next year, which is why I've kind of pushed to cut our earnings taxes for next year, and I haven't gotten the support from a majority of council. <coughs> However, if you look down the road, we're showing a deficit six years from now of about $7 million. And if the proposal that's in front of council by some members to double the social service funding goes through, we're going to have a $35 million deficit in six years. 
I hope that proposal doesn't go through, but the bottom line is down the road things don't look quite as good as they do now. Okay. Uh, final thing, real quick, we're almost out of time. The meeting on this Friday, December the 18th, is that open to the public? Absolutely. All sure. the meetings of the Joint And where will it be held? Open. It's going to be at the Convention Center. Be at the Convention Center. And what time is it? I don't have a clue. 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock <laughs> in the morning. Okay. Thank you very much. Just happened to check my calendar by coincidence before I came <laughs> okay, in. Okay. Thank you very much. Stay tuned. How many people who teach for half a century have students willing to sign up for their courses even if they have to sit on the floor and stand in line after class to get an autograph. Stay tuned. After the break, we will talk with Phil Shriver, one of Ohio's all-time great teachers. Welcome back. Newsmakers is devoted to listening to the people who shape our community for the future. No group of people have a greater impact on the future than teachers. And as all of us know too painfully, Really good teachers are few and far between. One of the area's best, historian Phil Shriver, retired this past week after teaching 52 years in the classroom. And when those 52 years are combined with his father's 49 years of teaching, that's 101 years of service to Ohio's students. Anyone who has ever spent any time with Phil Shriver comes away with a great sense of admiration. Ten days ago, I sat in on Dr. Shriver's second last class and prepared this report. Phil Shriver has walked thousands of miles through college corridors to open the doors of knowledge for countless students. And 52 years after he began teaching, more than 90 students packed the lecture hall, including the floors, for the last offering of his famous History of Miami University course. I think when I walk to my classes, when I walk around campus, I can look around and think of a story for each building. I can uh, kind of just cherish and absorb more of my experience. Shriver is a master storyteller weaving together elements of campus life, world events, and his own experiences. 18 to 24 months to crush the Japs. Latest estimate, I was out in the Pacific. We knew full well what was predicted. Time just passes quickly during the class, and I just love the way that he teaches and the, all the personal stories that he brings to it. Over the years, Shriver has learned that good teachers don't lecture from prepared notes to the class. He gets out from behind the podium and tries to engage each student as an individual. You can see in their eyes whether they are comprehending, whether they're with you, or whether they're now thinking about what's going to happen tonight or tomorrow or whenever. As somebody who began by teaching World War II vets and is ending teaching Gen Xers, Shriver has seen lots of changes. The campus even sounds different. Students no longer sing aloud. You're heard, heard singing constantly. I don't hear it anymore, and I'm troubled. I wish that somehow that joy that was represented in song would come alive again. But despite all the changes, Phil Shriver still sees an essential continuity. Students today, like the students then, are vibrant, dynamic young people with whom it's fun to relate. As you might guess, cutting Phil Shriver down to a minute 45 seconds is doing him an injustice. As a result, we have re-edited the interview to let you hear a bit more of what Dr. Shriver thinks. I began by asking him how college students have changed since he met his first class at Kent State University in 1947. When I started teaching, it was at Kent, 1947, the bulk of my students were GIs returning from the war. And I had row on row of them in khakis, camouflage, jumpsuits, battle jackets. Today's students obviously don't reflect that kind of a garb. But students today, like the students then, are vibrant, dynamic young people with whom it's fun to relate. It's a pleasure to, to, to teach them, to share with them. In some respects, they are different from what I knew back in 1947 when I started. And I've said this a number of times, I don't hear them singing anymore, and this troubles me. Because even as an, a high school student, and then as a college student in the 30s, the 40s, and continuing on through in the mid-60s, I heard singing all the time. It crossed the campus, and there'd be two over here, and then there'd be a single student walking down the hall, walking down the sidewalk and singing away. And at night, groups, often fraternities, sororities, heading uptown, singing as they would go, 
You'd have singing at Mother's Day song fest competition. You'd have singing when someone was getting pinned or lavalierd. You heard, heard singing constantly. I don't hear it anymore. And I'm troubled. I wish that somehow that joy that was represented in song would come alive again in, in these young people. And may, perhaps someday it will. And how have you changed as a teacher? When I began, I was loath to depart from notes. I felt I should always have before me a complete outline of everything I was going to cover. And then I found with the passage of the years that I had a far better response from students when I was simply in front of them talking as though it was one-to-one -one and not lecturing to a large group. You can see in their eyes whether they are comprehending, whether they're with you, or whether they're now thinking about what's going to happen tonight or tomorrow or whenever. And by watching their eyes with this visual contact with them, you find how to express your thoughts in such ways that will have appeal to them, that will enable them to visualize what it is you're talking about. Because if they can visualize it, they're going to remember it. If they can't visualize it, it's simply a fact that somehow they're going to have to ma master through memorization or whatever. What quality of Miami University do you want to be sure is never lost? I think the essential quality is what I'll call human scale. There's nothing here at Miami that overwhelms you as an individual. We have no huge skyscraping dormitories, no huge cathedrals of learning. <laughs> we have halls that are no more than three stories in height. We still have our original residence halls that hold 38 students apiece. Human scale is something that has made this campus particularly important, relevant to young people. And I hope we never lose it. On the other hand, what should be changed? I would hope that we could recapture some of the essence of what I'll call residentiality. I am concerned that today many students opt not to live in their residence halls in their last several years on campus, but to live out in town. And in effect, they become commuting students at that point, not there's anything wrong with commuting students, but when they're in a college environment, it's a total learning environment. And they learn from each other. They learn in contact with one another in the dining halls, in the recreation halls, in the lobbies of their residence halls where they have people come in and speak to them in the evening, or when they're simply discussing a question, an issue of the day. Students will learn as much from each other as they will in the classroom from their professors. And I think it's important to us to try to recapture the residentiality that we once had. I saw us the other day, a group alight from a bus, and it's one of our metro buses here in town. Fifteen of them got off, and 13 of the 15 were walking by themselves. Only two were walking together towards their condominium. And I thought, there's something missing here. They're not interacting. They're heading back to their individual rooms. And I would like to see restored, recaptured, the essence of residential life, which is interaction. And how about your future plans? Dan, I have two books on the griddle right now, one of which has a publishing deadline of February 15th, so there's no question about my hours between now and then. The second one will come out in the year 2000. And I hope after that, frankly, to take some time to write on some articles that I've had in the back burner for quite a period of time. And uh, this is what I hope to keep doing. Beyond that, I intend to enjoy life to the fullest here in Oxford, Ohio, which is a community I love. I have children living here, grandchildren living here. It's an anchor point for the whole family. And I intend to make the most of the time I have left with my wife in this beautiful community, enjoying family and friends. Dr. Shriver's new book on the history of Miami is now out in print, so you might want to get that if you're interested. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next Sunday. Depending on when the impeachment votes are taken on the floor of the House of Representatives, I hope to have our local representatives from Congress with us here if it's possible. Have a good week.